unique perspective on Japan itself as well. I would note in advance that the audience is welcome to submit questions to him, and I'll pass on the smart ones. And uh, well, Mr. Gupta, welcome, and thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me today for this uh, great forum. All right, well, it's a super interesting time in world economics and the car industry, so I'm gonna get right off to it. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief review and then I'm gonna ask you to react a bit. Um, so the global automotive industry is in a state of unprecedented upheaval over the last five years. We've had a trade war between the United States and China, which are both two massive automobile markets, then a pandemic that wrecked supply chains. Now we have a war in Europe, which has thrown off commodity prices. The period of inflation and low inflation is over in the West, at least, and that's increasing uh, economic uncertainty among producers and consumers. We have a shortage of semiconductors that is hobbled production. And the Chinese automotive supply just this summer was thrown off again by drop-induced power shortages. During this whole period, Nissan has been trying to revive investor confidence after a series of strategic missteps. That's including in the North American market. Um, that's battered its profits and share price. It's been trying to rebalance this famously fractious relationship with Renault. But external events keep on throwing wrenches into the gears. Uh, Ashwani, do you think that Nissan do you expect Nissan to catch a break from this constant tempo of external shocks? And assuming that it doesn't, what are you doing to pad Nissan and, and adapt for a future in which these sort of unpredictable random disruptions become a, a feature and not a bug? Yeah, that's a great, um, great uh, recap of all the challenges uh, global automotive industry is facing. And of course, uh, Nissan is part of it. Um, I would say um, we started the business transformation plan, which is driven by the cultural change um, before most of the challenges happened. And for us, this unprecedented crisis have accelerated our business transformation. And what it has created is agility and resilience in the organization, within, the, within our company, but also with our stakeholders, supplier partners, dealer partners. And, and what sort of evidence have, would you offer specifically of the agility, like in terms of your, your recent financial results? Like, I mean, I know you've done a bunch of work on cost I mean, cutting. Can you just throw us out some specifics? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, the business transformation plan is about three strategic pillars. The first one was rationalization, which is capacity optimization. When we said that we will be reducing more than $3 billion of cost, and we have done more than $4.5 billion of cost reduction by aligning our capacities with the real potential. So that, that is done. The second was we will increase our net revenue per unit by more than 10% of, by changing our way of doing business from volume to value. And I think we are around 16% of net revenue per unit increase. And the third one was, um, you know, cost cutting is, is not a brainer. What is really needed is to invest in the future growth. And while doing so, uh, we invested in 12 new products we invested in electrification, we invested in autonomous driving, we invested in digitalization, uh, which is now bringing, uh, bringing the growth for us, despite we have a uh, lot of headwinds uh, which, are, which are there. Now, in addition to that, if you ask us uh, what exactly we have changed uh, in the way uh, at first, in the way we source, so definitely uh, we have considered the geopolitics, we have considered the, the risk uh, in the way we source our supply chain, which means now we are controlling end-to-end -end the supply chain. The second, the way we manufacture uh, is not now any more annual production plan. Uh, it's like a weekly production plan, which means we and our suppliers are aligned on the daily management of the production plan. And the third, the way we sell uh, with, the, with, the, with the almost uh, <clears throat> inventories which are at threshold level, uh, we are pulling our sales driven by the customer demand. So which means 
the way we source, the way we manufacture, and way we sell has all been transformed to give more agility and resilience in the organization. Um, I'm just going to follow up with a, a, a recent um, news point, um, which the, uh, some other people that aren't giving you a break is Greenpeace. Um, we've had them produce a report that ranks uh, you along with uh, Toyota and Honda as like the worst in terms of your efforts on efforts on decarbonization, um, which was pretty harsh. Uh, one Greenpeace, Greenpeace guy said, and I quote, the time for hybrids is finished, um, which is basically criticizing, I mean, Nissan, Toyota is, is still making hybrids. Um, do they have any point here? Has, has Japan fallen behind in the clean car race? I mean, for us, um, in 2010, when we launched our mass production car, which was Leaf, at that time, you know, the customer didn't exist. The market didn't exist. The competition, competitors were not on the road. Governments were not asking, either by regulation or by incentive. I mean, this was purely driven by Nissan's green initiative, which is drive innovation to enrich people's life. And since then, we have not changed our purpose, which is number one, uh, to make cleaner cars, number two, to make safer cars, and number three, to make inclusive cars. And for all these three, we have electrification, we have uh, autonomous driving, and we have uh, the connected cars. We keep our mission, which is driven by a purpose. Having said that, country to country, when the policies are evolving, we align ourselves. That's what is, is Nissan doing. So if you, like, if you ask us, what is our strategy? Our strategy is <clears throat> clearly to be a leading green brand in the world by driving the innovation that enrich people's life. Now, whether the world is ready for 100% green tomorrow morning, I don't think so. We have to go through this journey and to plan this journey, we have ICE vehicles. Second, we have the e-power, which is electric motor driven uh, vehicle, which is exactly the same feeling as battery electric. And then we have battery electric. So we have to take the customer through this journey so that customer is by himself deciding that the battery electric car has got better driving excitement, better total cost of ownership, and it is cleaner, which is great for environment. And we want customer to decide it. We as automotive manufacturer are the enabler to facilitate, accelerate the customer journey towards a greener vehicle. Um, you have some governments that are trying to force the pace, obviously, especially vis-a-vis -vis hybrids. There was a proposal, I believe in the United Kingdom to um, ban them soon. Um, Toyota is up in arms about that. Uh, the European Union is looking down on them. Um, what is your take on, on the European approach that, that we need to accelerate as fast as we can to a pure BEV battery powered bottle and leave the hybrid behind? What are, what are the downsides to that, if any? I mean, we are fully prepared because our electrification strategy is built on two pillars. One is e-power and the second is battery EV. And always the question comes that what are the advantages of these two distinctive technologies? E-power is battery electric without the plug and battery EV is battery vehicle with the plug. When it comes to driving exploration, when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to the feeling, it is, it, is, it is the same. And this is from the customer viewpoint, but from the economy of scale viewpoint, uh, we use the same e-power train for e-power and the battery electric, which is very unique uh, in automotive industry, which means when we announced our investment in UK, which is our one plant in Europe, up to 1 billion pounds. It includes the plant modernization, but we have got the know-how to assemble uh, e-power train and battery EV on the same line. So which means we are already adapted to the powertrain mix. So if the governments are saying 
it's good for the customer, let's ban uh, e-power tomorrow morning, we are ready with the battery electric. If government is saying, no, 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 we can continue a little bit. So for us, either or is okay, because we are ready uh, to deliver to the customer both the offers. Well, I've got a question from the audience, um, uh, just specific about costs. Um, obviously, a lot of electric vehicle price points are quite a bit higher than conventional vehicles. Um, and now uh, we've got a bit of a surge in lithium prices, um, commodity prices, energy prices, everything. Um, do you anticipate that, that Nissan will have to lift prices for uh, models like the Leaf in Japan or, or elsewhere? Um, do, you, do, you, do you anticipate that these, this inflationary I mean, pressure will have to be translated into, into customer prices? I mean, that's a great question, right? I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would ask, myself a very fundamental question, um, who decides the price? And for us, it's customer decides the price. So we call it customer willingness to pay. And, and, and obviously, you know, we have one side of the business, which is how much customer is willing to pay, or we have other side of the, of the business, which is how much we can sustain uh, the raw material price increase. So we have to see it totally as two pillars on how much we can sustain is whether we can optimize the usage of the raw material. Yes, we are doing so. Uh, whether we can come up with a new technology. Yes, we are developing the cobalt free batteries, for example. Um, whether we can make lighter cars. Yes, we are doing so. Uh, whether we can do uh, five uh, distinctive powertrains into one compact e-powertrain. Yes, we are doing so. On the other side, um, what customer is willing to pay? Uh, I think customer is always willing to pay when he perceives uh, the, the customer, uh, uh, customer value in it. Uh, so for example, uh, when we are launching uh, our e-power in Japan, 50% uh, of our customers are the Conquest customers. They are downsizing themselves from big sedans to the compact electrified vehicles because they see it driving acceleration. They see the better total cost of ownership. So in that case, definitely customer is willing to pay. So for us, on one side, optimize the cost. On the other side, create the value which customer is willing to pay. And this is how the business mechanism work uh, for us. We don't raise the prices just for the sake of prices, because we are not the deciders. Customer is the decider. Okay, I understand. Um, I just want to drill into that a little bit further because there's another factor at play, um, which would be the, the falling buying power of the, the Japanese yen. Um, we have seen an unprecedented, at least I think it's unprecedented, speedy, speedy decline in the exchange rate. Um, in the past year and a half, it's gone from around 100 per dollar to now it's flirting with 150, I think. It was 144 yesterday. Uh, the central bank is getting involved and, and trying to, to stem the route a bit. Um, but obviously, it's going to be very difficult for Japan, which is maintaining its current interest rate policy while the, the United States tries to fight off inflation by, by hiking um, for any sort of relief on that front to come through. Now, I know that traditionally, a lot of Japanese automakers benefited um, from a weak yen to the extent that it flattered dollar-based earnings overseas. But obviously that is offset um, if your raw materials prices are more expensive in dollar terms. And I note in your last earnings report, you, you did see some FX gains, but they were more than offset by raw material gains. Um, can you just talk us through how Nissan is, is positioned to kind of cope with a, a volatile and possibly continually declining domestic currency? Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. Um, uh, when we look at uh, foreign exchange, um, this comes at the last part of the business value chain uh, because we don't take our decisions, especially the mid and long-term decisions based on the current foreign exchange rate. I think that's a, that's a basic assumption. Now, whether our global footprint will evolve because of current exchange rate? I don't think so, because exactly what you said, we have to see in totality. So you have foreign exchange tailwind when we export the things, but we have foreign exchange headwinds when we import the things. Now, what is the trade balance? 
second, if we start making most of the cars in Japan, we may get net net benefit. But then what do we do with the capacities in uh, other parts of the world? We have more than 40 plants around the world, right? What do we do in the other plants of the world? I mean, how we are going to run the operational cost of those, of those plants. Then there is one more dimension which is coming up, as you know, is that most of the countries are asking for the localization in, in, in those countries. Those localizations are also linked to the customer incentives. And at the end, we are here to serve our customers. So I think there are multi dimensions which are coming uh, in the business decisions. Um, and, and of course, foreign exchange is playing an important role, but not the most important role. And that's how uh, we have to uh, adapt our business, uh, business decisions, considering all the drivers. I've got two follow-ups on that more specifically. So um, the United States Inflation Reduction Act um, is trying to reshape incentives to bring more production and assembly of the electric vehicle supply chain into the United States and take it out of China. Um, how does Nissan adapt to that? Nissan in 2010 uh, industrialized the first battery electric car in the United States. And again, you know, we wanted to do it for the customer, for the environment. We localized the battery over there. We localized the leaf uh, in the United States. We welcome the IRA because this is in line with what Nissan has been doing for the last 12 years around the world. IRA is going to accelerate the competitive electrification uh, uh, towards the future. Having said that, uh, the content and the timing are challenging and the magnitude of challenge is high. And that's what we have to work on together uh, with all uh, the collaborators that how we minimize the magnitude of the challenge of timing and the content so that we get the execution of this accelerated um, action for the electrification. But at the end, electrification is not for electrification. Electrification is for the customer, is for the planet, and that remains unchanged. Okay. Um, I'm gonna pivot to the, the alliance relationship. I'm getting some questions about that, which I'll try to summarize here. Um, so uh, for those unfamiliar watching, um, Nissan Renault relationship has been famously unbalanced for quite some time. Um, one of the issues uh, is that, that, that Renault, and by extension, the French government has a massive voting stake in Nissan and that, that stake is not replicated. That voting power is not present in terms of Nissan's investment in Renault. Um, that has created a lot of problems. It's blamed for the blow up of a mooted merger between Renault and Fiat Chrysler back in 2019. Um, since then, um, and since the whole scandal with Carlos Ghosn, which we'll get to in a bit, um, there has been, it, it appears to, to, to me that there's been some warm movement attempts to kind of fix the relationship, reallocate things. Um, but I, I just wanna ask you, like some of it seems substantial, some less. What do you think are the most substantial things um, that have happened in this relationship to improve it and make it more stable going forward? And do you think that it's possible that we might actually see a substantial rebalancing of these financial stakes, which has caused so much suspicion and ill will in both, in both um, France and Japan? I would go for a forward-looking approach. Um, since 2019, um, we have worked together for benefit of each company by utilizing the alliance assets. We have done two significant announcements which were not driven by that we are working for the synergy. I think the biggest change point in the new alliance is we are working to boost the performance of each company by utilizing the alliance assets. I think this is a change point. 
the some of the substantial announcements or the projects which we have concluded in last two years. For example, as a part of Nissan Next, the number two pillar, which I said, you know, number one, rationalization, number two, focus on core products and core markets, and number three, source seeds for the future. Focusing in core products and core markets. For Nissan, core markets, United States, China, Japan, obviously Europe, between two to 2.5% market share is important, but it's not most important. It was not most important. So do we keep on investing in a market where we have the strength of our partner? Um, and our answer was why we should invest in this market. Why not to use uh, the Alliance asset, which is Renault. And then we decided, uh, you know, the micro successor uh, to, uh, to use, to use Renault, which is one of the biggest decisions. And Micra is Nissan icon, right? It, it was used to manufacture around the world. But we believe that Nissan is great when it comes to B plus, C, D, and E segments. But we are not very competitive when we try to make ourselves A segment and B segment. So that's where we, we went for it. Second, we went for the LCV electric vans. I mean, I mean, imagine what would be the investment Nissan has to do uh, to do the uh, investment in the electric vans in Europe. And if we are not investing in electric vans in Europe with all the regulations and driven by the cafe, how we can sustain our ice business. So I think these are the two projects which I would say uh, we have concluded. Uh, and there are many, many more. Uh, for example, first time Mitsubishi uh, uh, got the access uh, to Renault uh, in Europe. And, and I think Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi get a thing. So my point is the thing which has changed, number one is we work together for the mutual benefit, which is driven by the performance. Number two is the relationship between the top leaders of the three companies are driven by our interactions and we meet each other on a weekly basis. We now the travel restrictions have been lifted. We are meeting physically almost on a monthly basis. So one side, the business decisions, another side, uh, our interactions. I think this put together, we can say that we are moving uh, towards a very strong uh, relationship which will prepare the next. Alliance. What about Renault's idea of spinning off its EV venture and inviting um, Nissan and Mitsubishi to invest? There's been sort of a ominous silence from the Nissan side. What, 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 should, what, what should we what should we make of that? I, I, I don't think that Nissan is silent on this subject. I, I think um, Luca Demio was uh, very proactive in sharing with us. Uh, about this uh, about this project, um, you know this uh, project is driven by uh, Renolution, um, which is of course uh, focusing in Europe. And as I said before, electrification is driven by markets, customers. And when we look at Europe, it will go for hundred percent electrification. Number one, market is ready. Number two, customer is ready. And number three, competitors are there with all the options. So I, I don't believe that it will not go. It could be only the timing issue, which means seen from the Renault with Europe as the most important market when market is ready to go towards electrification. I think uh, to have that electric car out is the right way to do as per the resolution. On the other side, when we look at Nissan, uh, we have United States, China, Japan, and, and Europe, where each market has a, a distinctive journey towards electrification. So we have to manage this transition. Uh, uh, so in, in Europe, uh, definitely we want to utilize the alliance assets uh, towards the electrification. Now, 
till which extent we are going to utilize that. That is the discussion which we are constructively having uh, with the Reno leadership team. And once we are ready, uh, we will be definitely sharing with you. Um, let me just follow up on part of this, this, this division. So there's the idea that, that, that each car maker will have its own regional focus. Um, so Renault is obviously strong in Europe, um, but, uh, and, and there's been Nissan for various reasons, uh, sorry, Renault for various reasons has, has basically retreated from China significantly um, to the extent that it's just got a few small JVs in there. But um, I was struck by uh, the CEO, Luca DeMeo, said he's hoping to return to China. And he's also, there's also this, this deal with Geely where um, I don't quite know what to make of it. Um, you know, obviously this is a very important automobile market, but uh, is, is Renault supposed to be pushing that hard in China um, if Asia is your backyard? You know, this, um, this is very, very brand specific strategy. So um, I will not be able to comment on that, right? This is very Renault specific uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, I would like to emphasize um, that what and how exactly we work, though our markets are different, but we have three things. We have market by market, we have product by product, and we have technology by technology. So though our markets are different, but when it comes to product, the platforms are common. When I talk about Megan eTech and Aria, the platform is common. Uh, when I look at uh, all the uh, C and D segment, uh, the platform is common. So irrespective of that Renault is focusing on Europe and we are focusing in Europe and other, other parts of the world, our platforms are common. Then the third thing comes on the technology. Um, when it comes to battery, you know, we decided to use the common battery. When it comes to uh, using of uh, hardware in the connected vehicle, we have common. So, uh, so I think we have three clear pillars where we find the collaboration, market, product, and technology. You guys are known for, I mean, you're, you like watching car races and, and uh, Nissan has these, these uh, very fast conventional combustion vehicles, uh, you know, Nissan Z and these guys. How, how are you gonna fit those in with, with electrification? <laughs> That's a great question. Wow, thank you. Um, you know, the same question was asked to me uh, uh, last year um, when I revealed uh, the Z, um, with the nine auto transmission, but also the six manual transmission in, in New York. And my answer was, we are doing cars for our fans, especially the sports cars. So when I talk to the sports fan of Z, uh, what they want, they want to hear the engine sound. They want to see that driving acceleration. So, um, so, uh, you know, we have to do car for them, right? Then uh, we have the customers um, who are uh, asking us that, no, they also want something which is good for the environment. So that's why we developed the e-fuel and we raised uh, Z uh, with the, with the e-fuel. So which means the, the sport fans which won the engine sound, speed, but environment friendly, we have developed a fuel for them. And then the third thing is the customers or the fans, they don't want engine sound, but they want speed, but they also want um, the climate, uh, the environment friendly solution. And for this, we do the Formula E. And, the, and you know, people, I mean, when, when, when I am asked why, uh, Nissan is investing in Formula E uh, because we did our commitment for the next generation, generation three, because we want to learn this technology from Formula E, which is no engine sound, but speed. 
And then Can't you, like, one day, fake the engine sound though, like I, I, the movie theaters where they put like the vibration in the seats and everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, isn't there like a way to get around that without actually putting fussel emissions in the air? I feel like that's I mean, solvable. If, if you if you ask that question speaker. to a sports fan, <laughs> if you ask that question to sports fan, I yeah. mean, uh, no way that artificial sound can 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 replace uh, the thrill you have on the steering. When you hear um, uh, when you hear the the sound from the from the engine, uh, so once again, why we are doing Formula E is of course for our fans, but also to learn the electric technology driven by acceleration, speed, and then one day to transfer that to our future sports cars. But are we ready today? I don't think so, because our customers are still asking us to give them thrilling cars, which is which are Z and GTR. How threatened are you or in the long, okay, looking 20 years out, right, mind you, but like, I mean, it has been quite notable, the advances recently that Chinese automakers have started making, especially in the EV space. The country dominates the supply chain. Um, these guys, these engineers have grown up, you know, working in some of the best uh, car companies in the world. They've learned obviously how to make cars um, and they're starting to export. They're forming alliances with you and everybody else. Um, I mean, for, for decades, these JV partners in China were these kind of jokes, you know, these giant SOEs just sat there and took money from the joint ventures and, and then didn't build anything that anybody would buy inside China or out. But now clearly we have some companies like Great Wall, Geely, and we've got Neo, you know, that investors are quite excited about and are, are moving up the value chain. And they've got, they're sitting on, you know, this huge supply chain. They've got policy support. Um, how much does Nissan, do Nissan and, and, and these other guys, you know, who have been seeing slowing sales growth in China, by the way, um, how much do the big champion automakers need to worry about the Chinese? You know that Nissan is one of the first joint venture in China. And, you know, it was just, I think one or two days before pandemic was, announced in China, I was there. I was there in Wuhan because, you know, our headquarters is in Wuhan. I did not and since that. then, oh. and since then, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm not fortunate to, uh, to travel to China. So it's almost for me three years. Um, now in what we see, uh, even if we are running the business remotely, uh, what we see is definitely, um, there is a significant progress in the cars launched by the Chinese OEMs. Um, we had uh, got some cars in Japan. I personally drove it with my executives. Number one, the perceived quality has been significantly improved and in line uh, with the average global uh, perceived quality. I will not say better or less, but let me say more or less average. Uh, when it comes to the driving and handling, this is also, I would say, uh, it's, at, it's at global level. But which the things which surprised me was that how quickly they have adapted to the new development way, which is, which is software uh, driven uh, cars. Uh, and I do believe that that has given the Chinese OEMs a competitive edge for time to market. So when uh, you know, the, the conventional OEMs go through their own process of the development, and when we look at, I'm not inside the, you know, the development process of the Chinese OEMs, but what I see and what I feel looking at the electronic architecture, looking at the software capability, that definitely they have reduced or optimized their development process by a significant amount. That is giving them a competitive edge um, in terms of time to market, but also content of the, of, the, of the car. So we, Nissan, our policy is very clear. We always take competition as a healthy sign to improve 
where we have to improve. On the other side, where we have our strength when it comes to uh, you know, the driving exploration, when it comes to autonomous driving, all these kind of uh, technologies we have, we have to be uh, more uh, stronger on that. On the other side, where we do believe we have to catch up. Yes, we have to learn from, uh, from, these, uh, from these OEMs. For me, competition is always better and it teaches you to improve further and grow further. Is there room for you guys to go into hydrogen cars? Is that something that's interesting? Given I mean, the, the question is, the you know, global energy we, 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 Nissan, Nissan has this technology, right? I don't know, 20 years mm -hmm. before we sold it. And I think that technology is used by some of the taxi companies. The question is why we should go for it. Um, and when I asked this question to myself, why I should go for it, to be honest, I don't get the answer uh, because um, if we go it for driving exploration, I think the battery electric is better. If we want to go it, Nissan, right? If we want to go it for environment, yes, uh, both are uh, better. Number three, uh, whether we can install uh, the, the infrastructure at home, I have a question. When it comes to battery electric, 70% of our customers charge at home. They go to office, come back from office, put the plug in, go to bed. Next morning, the car is ready to take them back to the office. So those are the things that we are considering at the end, which technology is creating the maximum value to the customer. When we look at it, we prioritize battery EV and e-power. Understand. Okay, um, so I'm gonna dig up some ancient history here um, just for a moment. Uh, so the scandal around your former chairman, Carlos Ghosn, was one of the most painful in Nissan and Renault's collective corporate history, I would say. Um, so excuse for wincing if I summarize it for some of the people who didn't pay close attention. Um, in a nutshell, um, Ghosn felt he was underpaid. Um, he did something about that that uh, Japanese prosecutors did not like. Um, they jailed him. Um, it was this huge media mess. Um, and then he escaped in a piece of luggage to Lebanon. Um, and it was just one of the most incredible, dramatic, ridiculous corporate scandals, I think, in, in automotive history. I, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and nobody came out looking very good. The Japanese justice system looked pretty harsh. Uh, Gone looked venal. Nissan looked badly governed for not being on top of it. Um, what are your takeaways now that the dust has settled a little bit um, from that whole experience? I am more about the forward looking uh, approach, right? And we have to move on. Mm -hmm. And um, number one is, you know, the Nissan has established um, the three committee governance structure, uh, which is nomination committee, compensation committee, and the audit committee, which is run by all independent directors. I think very strong governance has been put in the Nissan. That's number one. Number two is that we created Nissan Next, which is owned by our employees and our partners. And now we are delivering that business transformation plan. Number three, while delivering the business transformation plan, we plan 10 years, which is ambition 2030, driven by electrification, autonomous driving, and the connected. Number four, we defined the new alliance, which is performance for performance utilization of alliance assets, driven by the mutual agreements among the top leaders of the three companies. And all these four to five key actions which we took are paying, and you can see that how we are progressing uh, towards, a, towards, a, towards a bright future. Well, what's, what's been striking me on my, my visit to Tokyo right now, um, which has been a, a long running, a slowly running trend, but um, it's been quite interesting to, to notice how many um, foreigners I'm meeting 
who are running or at the very top of, of Japanese companies. Um, so you've got foreigners running Takeda, the pharmaceutical company. Um, I, the, uh, the head of, of Mitsubishi Chemical is a Belgian guy, I think. Um, you know, and, and then we have Gon and, and you. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, you've done a full tour of, of Nissan and Renault. You're an engineering guy, you know, you, you're, you're a car makers kind of executive. Um, but Nissan in particular is this company where obviously geopolitics and national loyalties and all these other factors have played this outsized role. Um, you know, and then you have the Gon scandal. Do you think after that, after all that, you know, there is room, you know, for somebody like you to move into the top position again at Nissan or did Gon ruin it for everybody? I mean, I would look at it in, in two ways. Um, number one is I'm already at the top position. Uh, number two, number two, uh, what happens to me next? I think it's only nomination committee who can discuss and who can decide. Um, on the other side, um, Nissan um, has been recognized as a most diverse company. Uh, not in only terms of employees, but also in terms of customers, but also the product lineup. I mean, we make from Well, I think a career in diplomacy awaits you as well. That was, <laughs> if not cards, oh, that was, that was, okay. Well, look, that was great. I really appreciate you taking the time. We are now out of time, I think, right to the minute. Um, Ashwani, it's always a pleasure to talk to you um, and uh, I wish you and your company the best um, during these difficult times. I think I speak for the whole world when we hope there are no more black swans in store for, for Nissan, for energy prices, for, for you name it. And uh, anyways, um, and so thanks again. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody in our audience for attending. And I'd like to also to thank the uh, Reuters production team for helping us put this together so smoothly. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.